freedom. Few understand its true cost. Some have lived to tell their story of attaining it, while others sacrificed living itself in the battle. Before the building of the Statue of Liberty and other symbols of the American dream, the men of the revolution fought for one simple cause, freedom. One of its bloodiest battles and the turning point of the American Revolution took place right here on the Oriskany battlefield. Because of the Patriots and their Oneida Indian allies that fought beside them on that summer day, the Mohawk Valley can claim its critical role in the founding of our nation. Before the story of the monumental battle can be told, we must first know what was at stake. We must know what the men at Oriskany fought and died for. Sometime in the spring of 1776, Colonel Elias Dayton of the Continental Army and his troops took charge of and rebuilt Fort Stanwix in Rome. After the fort's completion, Dayton renamed the fort Fort Schuyler in honor of General Philip Schuyler. During the spring of 1777, Colonel Peter Gansevoort and the New York 3rd Regiment would occupy the fort. It was British General John Burgoyne who developed a three-part plan to siege Fort Schuyler in August 1777. Leading the siege would be Lieutenant Colonel Barry St. Ledger, and under his command were his British troops, Sir John Johnson and his Royal Greens, and Joseph Brandt, commander of the Mohawk and Seneca Indians. St. Ledger would begin his journey at Three Rivers in Canada, and together these forces would travel from Oswego to Rome and capture or destroy Fort Schuyler. From there, they would advance to Albany with orders to kill anyone who stood in their path. Burgoyne was to advance through the Champlain Valley and down the upper Hudson River, while General William Howe was to lead his troops up the Hudson. Burgoyne, Howe, St. Ledger, and Brant would then meet in Albany, almost at the same time. We're here at the Fort Stanwix National Monument in Rome. Behind me you can see a replica of Fort Stanwix, which at the time of the Oriskany battle was known as Fort Schuyler. In the weeks leading up to the siege, Colonel Peter Gansevoort was well aware of the British plan for advancement toward the fort. He enlisted the assistance of fellow revolutionaries from the Mohawk Valley, the Tryon County Committee of Safety. He felt as though the safety of Fort Schuyler rested in great part on the shoulders of a group of brave men who were commanded by a fearless general. To my left, you can see the monument for General Nicholas Herkimer, located in Myers Park in the town of Herkimer. Not far from this very location, General Herkimer was born in the town of German Flats around 1728. The oldest of 13 children and the son of Palatine German immigrants, he would gain a great deal of military experience during the French and Indian War. During the Revolution, he would side with the American colonists, and in 1775, he was named Colonel of the 1st Battalion of the Tryon County Militia, and later he would be named the Chairman of the Tryon County Committee of Safety. Like Gansevoort, General Herkimer understood the potential danger of a British attack on Fort Schuyler. On July 7th, he made an announcement stating that, quote, the enemy, 2,000 strong, was at Oswego, and that as soon as he should approach, every male person being in health and between 16 and 60 years of age should immediately be ready to march against him. End quote. On August 4th, Herkimer and his unit left Fort Dayton and crossed the Mohawk River at Utica, arriving at Whitesboro the following day. Somewhere between Whitesboro and Oriskany, a group of Oneida Indians joined Herkimer and his men. The general had a message delivered to Fort Schuyler stating that he and his men were approaching and requested aid from Colonel Gansevoort. The message also stated that Herkimer and his men would refrain from moving forward until they heard three cannon blasts. On August 6, members of the Committee of Safety and Herkimer's subordinate officers began to panic. The signal that they were waiting for had yet to come. They began to speculate that Fort Schuyler had fallen to the enemy, and they were sure that they would be next. The general finally held a meeting with his officers to explain his reasons for hesitation in marching forth. Herkimer explained to his officers that he was entrusted with the well-being and leadership of his men. He felt that marching on would lead them to a useless slaughter. The officers at Herkimer's command refused to accept his logic. They called him a coward and accused him of being sympathetic toward the enemy. 
Some even called him the worst name of all, a Tory, which was an American colonist that sided with the British. Herkimer was beside himself. He lashed out at his men saying, quote, you will be the first in the face of the enemy to flee, and then gave his famous two-word order, march on. In 1776, General Nicholas Herkimer made a vow to serve the Continental Army, and to a man of his character, such words were not uttered sparingly. And so when Herkimer's subordinates questioned his courage and loyalty, the prideful general defied his instincts. He continued to lead them on their 40-mile journey to Fort Schuyler, knowing that for many of them, death was imminent. However, not even Herkimer could have expected what lie ahead. On August 5, 1777, British Lieutenant Colonel Barry St. Ledger was warned by skillful scouts about the advancement of General Herkimer toward Fort Schuyler. Mohawk Commander Joseph Brandt had informed St. Ledger that Herkimer's militia was held up at Oriskany and that his men were untrained, inexperienced, and traveling without lookouts. St. Ledger made the arrangements to send approximately 700 men under Sir John Johnson to ambush General Herkimer and his forces. Meanwhile, the 40-mile march commenced as Herkimer led his men for three to four miles, up and down hills and over corduroy roads constructed over marshes. The forest was thickening, and the roadway ahead led to a marsh and a ravine. Still, the men marched forth rapidly and without regard for potential attackers. It was about 10 in the morning when they reached another ravine, and then suddenly, in one surreal moment, before the sounds around them could be identified, Herkimer and his men were under attack. In split seconds, the loud sounds of rifles rang out and clouds of smoke appeared everywhere. Mohawks and Senecas with painted faces armed with knives, spears, and hatchets appeared from behind trees. Fighting bravely alongside Herkimer's militia were Oneida Indians such as Han Yeri and his wife, two kettles together, who are shown in this painting. Herkimer rallied the men around him as they stood back to back, fending off their enemies. The attackers had chosen their field well, as Herkimer and his men were afforded no cover options. As they fired their rifles, many were charged by Mohawks and Senecas, attacked and killed. Knives, clubs, rifle butts, and bayonets were wielded as the horrifying sounds of hand-to-hand -hand combat filled the summer air. Early on in the battle, a shot passed through Herkimer's left knee, killing his horse. While under heavy fire, Brigade Surgeon Dr. William Petrie was wounded, but nonetheless managed to wrap the general's leg. Although they were untrained and undisciplined, Herkimer's men never panicked, and they began to confront the enemy effectively. Herkimer instructed some of his men to remove the saddle from his horse and place it next to a nearby beech tree. He then asked to be lifted and set upon it. Surrounded by chaos and gunfire, the general calmly took out his pipe and lit it. An advisor begged him to seek safer ground, to which the general famously replied, I will face the enemy. As the opposition continued to close in, Herkimer's men were fighting in separate groups. One group was ordered to form a circle, fighting the enemy from all different directions. The effective strategy forced the opposition to attack with bayonets. After about two hours of fighting, a vast number of men were either dead, dying, or severely injured. Suddenly, a violent thunderstorm broke out, and the enemy pulled back to seek shelter. Throughout this portion of the battle, and still propped up against the tree, the brave and heroic General Herkimer remained to guide his men. While the enemy sought shelter from the storm, Herkimer ordered his men to get out of the ravine and onto higher ground. During this break in the battle, he chose a location approximately where the battlefield monument is today. To avoid a rush attack on his marksmen, Herkimer told his men to seek cover in groups of twos behind trees. This strategy allowed one marksman to fire a rifle while the other reloaded. After about an hour's time, the storm passed over and the attack was back on. Herkimer's new strategy and positioning of his men was paying off, 
as once a marksman fired a shot, the Indians would charge and discover there was another loaded rifle waiting in reserve. With the Mohawks and Senecas now holding back, St. Ledger sent a second detachment of Royal Greens to back them up. The Royal Greens sent to this battle were men who fled Tryon County to stand with Great Britain. Some of them were neighbors of Herkimer's men. The mutual hate between the two sides equated to a fight to the death. The resentment between the two groups was so great that once the shots were fired from their weapons, they didn't even attempt to reload. Instead, they attacked one another with whatever objects they had in their hands, bayonets, knives, and butts of rifles. As the fight commenced, suddenly the signals fired from the cannons at Fort Schuyler were finally heard. Colonel Marinus Willett, accompanied by approximately 250 men, began to raid the British and Indian camps near Fort Schuyler. Once the enemy was warned of these raids, they began to disengage from the Oriskany battle. The Royal Greens, who wore hats that were similar to the colonists, were ordered to turn their jackets inside out to pose as relief from Fort Schuyler. The Royal Greens' coat trick was no match for the keen eye of Captain Jacob Gardner of the militia, who directed his men to fire in all, about 30 turncoats were killed and the remainder fled. The Mohawks and Senecas heard their call for retreat and followed suit, as did the remaining Tories. At about 3 p.m., after five hours of battle, General Herkimer and his Tryon County militia were the only remaining forces on the field at Oriskany. The dead and wounded were lying in blood throughout the landscape. Men from both sides fought with everything from the weapons in their hand to the teeth in their mouth. Of course, St. Ledger claimed to be the victor at Oriskany, and based upon the number of casualties on each side, he would be correct. However, it were his forces that ultimately retreated from the battlefield. Still, Herkimer and his men never made it to Fort Schuyler, and that was the sole purpose of the 40-mile march. With that said, it has been speculated by many that the Mohawk and Seneca Indians sustained such great losses at Oriskany that they became hesitant to engage in future conflicts. If that claim were accurate, General Herkimer and his men could very well be declared the victors. I'm standing currently at the site of Old Fort Schuyler, just east of Union Station in Utica. General Herkimer and the wounded men of his regiment were transported here following the Battle of Oriskany. From here, the general was sent on a ride down the Mohawk River back to his homestead. He'd survived the battle, however, his wounded leg had become infected as it took several days for him to receive medical treatment. His regiment surgeon, Dr. William Petrie, was unable to provide him medical attention as he too was wounded at the time. It's likely that the general had no idea he'd given his final command at the Battle of Oriskany. When the bullet that passed through him struck his horse, the animal fell on top of his leg, shattering it in the process. Behind me is the former home of General Nicholas Herkimer at the Herkimer home site in Little Falls. It was here that the general journeyed to following the battle to receive medical treatment. Robert Johnson, a surgeon from Benedict Arnold's army, suggested that the leg be amputated. Following what appeared to be a successful surgery, Colonel Willett visited the general in his home. Herkimer was sitting up in his bed, smoking his pipe and in excellent spirits. What he didn't know at the time was that the surgeon who performed the operation was inexperienced, and after the surgery was completed, Herkimer's wound bled uncontrollably. The general had come to the realization that he would not survive his post-operative state, and so he asked for his Bible and began reading it aloud. It wasn't more than 10 days prior that the men in Herkimer's militia were taunting the great general, questioning his fortitude and his dedication to the fight for independence. March on, he responded. It wasn't more than 10 days prior that he was wounded, leaning against a tree, stating, I will face the enemy, as bullets flew just inches from his head. On August 16, 1777, General Nicholas Herkimer died in his homestead. To his very last breath, he gave his mind, body, and soul to one simple cause, freedom.